2024 marks 35 years since the premiere of License to Kill, Timothy Dalton's second and final outing as 007. The film was controversial at the time because its gritty approach and violent narrative jettisoned some of the elements to which Bond fans had become accustomed. Although box office disappointment upon release, it has gained a cult following over the years. And to celebrate this underrated film, the British James Bond fan club put on a birthday party complete with a panel of experts. I managed to grab three of them during the evening for impromptu chats. In this episode, I'm speaking with film studies lecturer Kerry Edwards, author of a monograph on the two James Bond films starring Timothy Dalton, and I started by asking him why did he pick the Dalton Bonds as his subject? Well, it's, it's partly a love letter to License to Kill and The Living Daylight, Timothy Dalton's James Bond in general, but it's also my goal was to argue that these are not the unloved stepchildren of the James Bond franchise, that these are terrific entries, and particularly with License to Kill, quite an interesting and experimental entry, ahead of its time in many ways. But leaned into uh, the American action genre way more yes. than the other Bond films did and, yeah. and it's interesting to see how the idea of Bond going rogue on a personal revenge mission may have permeated other things. Indeed. Uh, the uh, recent incumbent of the role comes to mind who did yes. something very similar. Yes, but not and as good. Many say that Dalton's gritty portrayal of Bond foreshadowed what Craig later did. Yeah, I think Taking so. it further. Arguably Slightly different in, in, in lots of ways because the iconography of the Bond films are more settled with, with Dalton. He never dumps those things. But he does push into a harsher realm and, and particularly into a very Ian Fleming realm. And I think License to Kill, which is the, the of his two movies, the one that is the most Timothy Dalton James Bond, the most settled and yep. fits him the best, is, is one of the films that inhabits Fleming the best, apart from the earliest films in the series, like Dr. Aaron from yeah, which, the the, plot which were very... closer to the, to, the, yeah. to the original novels. Well, um, I, I got fed up with watching people make lists of James Bond films and putting Timothy Dalton at the bottom and saying he was bo boring, dull, or the films were unfunny, yeah. or the films were bad. And I was like, no, they're not. So I wrote it. Yeah, as a sort of a defense, but also as a love letter, just to say they're worth watching. And you know what? It turns out I wasn't alone. And since no, no, I came out, loads of people have talked to me, and I've been on podcasts, and I'm here now. And it's, it's the Dolphin films have grown in appreciation massively Absolutely. in 35 years. And I think the advantage of being able to watch them at home and appreciate them outside of the cinema and then see them on re-release on the big screen has generated interest and excitement and so they've kind of been rediscovered and there's lots of behind the scenes issues that perhaps men license skill wasn't as big a hit as it should have been could have been when it came out in 1989 it was the most insane summer of blockbuster cinema there has After, perhaps oh, yeah. ever been it's dubbed the summer of sequel yeah um the american advertising was particularly poor for the film. The, the poster it, it is did dreadful. It disappoint in the US. It, it did okay worldwide. Absolutely. UK it was controversial because it had a 15 certificate. Um, oh, yeah. So that limited the audience. And by that point, the Bond films had very much become associated with family yeah. and holidays. And there's almost always a James Bond film on a, a Sunday afternoon when it's raining or a bank holiday Monday. And then suddenly you're in the cinema and a guy's getting his leg bitten off. Yeah. yeah. Just doing yeah. the one we saw today is not the version that was released in Britain at the time. It was slightly shorter. The shot of Felix Leiter's leg when you're under the water, we didn't get to see that. I think until the Ultimate Edition DVD in the, the late right. 90s, that was verboten, as it were, for us for many, many years. Now that you said that, I have to check my, uh, my uh, Blu-ray, yeah. see which version I actually I think have. I think all of them now are the, the uncut version, as it right. were. But they really had a struggle with the BBFC over how violent to make this. And they were really upset because Batman came out and got a 12. And we could have an argument about yeah. what's worse. But Batman it didn't have severed legs, though. No, it didn't. But it did have a lot, fair bit of swearing, a bit of horror. Yes. But it has, Batman has the defense of being fantastical. It's a man in a bat suit. Yes. Whereas License Skill is pretty realistic, particularly for a Bond film. True. It takes True. place in real locations. There's very few... Uh, sets use a lot of uh, real locations that they've dressed and converted yeah. 
you know, even that crazy place at the end is a real place in the middle of the sort of Mexican desert that they change into Professor Joe's, what is it, meditation center, oh, yeah, or whatever yeah. it's called. So it has a, a, and the way it was shot by Alec Mills, it, it, it's, it's lit quite harshly and quite realistically to make it feel like it could happen. And actually, Sanchez's Noriega is, I mean, actually, at the time, the producers were criticized for Sanchez. They said, the, the people said, that's outrageous, drug dealers aren't like that. And now we know from TV shows like Narco or, or whatever, Sanchez has got nothing on the real thing. He didn't have hippos out the back, sadly. I grew up in the Roger Moore era, yeah. and so I expected my Bond villains to want to dominate the world. Yeah. And the Dalton baddies... Yeah, but, it, it is so think, much more small scale, but that then kind of returns to the scale of the novels. And the, the sure, you know, yeah. Fleming's novels are thrillers. They are mostly reasonably believable. They have some moments, um, sure, yeah. but they're set in, set in a world full of detail. It's Fleming's great strength, I think, with his journalistic background. He could conjure up a lot of detail, which would make you believe things and maybe let you ignore things that perhaps weren't quite so believable. Mm. But that's the skill of a great writer, is yeah. to, to slip the big things past you while you're interested in the, <laughs> the minutiae. A large book of mine called The Vigilante Thriller came out in January. Okay. From Bloomsbury Academic. That's a bit of a heavy work. But of course, Licence to Kill is kind of a vigilante film. Absolutely. It's not something I've talked about a lot, but there are parallels. Probably one of the least Bond formulaic films they made. In, in some ways, absolutely. It certainly broke certain conventions. Too many for some people, but again, over time, I think we've got used to the breaking of conventions. We're more willing to accept those yeah. sorts of things. Um, I'm working on some stuff on Clint Eastwood. I've written about Dirty okay. Harry and Clint Eastwood a bit, and I'm writing some more about that. And I've got some stuff about Paul Verhoeven's uh, sci-fi films, Starship Troopers, Total Recall, and Robocop, oh, which we, I, I need have to get on with. I'll speak again. Yes. Brilliant. Yeah. I hope so. And before you go, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell icon to get notified whenever I post new content. Thank you.